Okay, well, welcome to the March Sizzle Seminar. Uh, I'm John Klein and I'll be filling in as host for uh, Jeff DLB today. So I'm very happy to introduce our own uh, Matt Long. Uh, Matt is a scientist in the oceanography section of the Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory at NCAR. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in civil and environmental engineering from Tufts University and a PhD from Stanford. His research at NCAR uh, centers on questions related to the global uh, carbon cycle and the impacts of climate variability and change on ocean biogeochemistry and marine ecosystems. In his spare time, uh, Matt has spearheaded the Grassroots Earth Systems Data Sciences Initiative, which he is going to talk about today. So before I hand the mic over to Matt, uh, just a reminder that you can type in your questions uh, in Slido at the bottom of the screen, and we'll, uh, Matt will address those at the end of the talk. So Matt, handing it over to you. Great, thanks, John. I really appreciate the invitation and opportunity to speak um, to Sizzle today. Um, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the Earth System Data Science Initiative um, that we, uh, a number of us have been working on over the past few years. So a starting point for this conversation is really uh, an underlying uh, motivation to make a difference in the world. And I just wanna uh, present this, this photograph taken in 1968 by William Anders above aboard the Apollo 8 um, lunar mission. And this, this photograph made a really big impact on, on society and, and specifically the environmental movement in the late 60s and early 70s. It's really the first time that we, that we gained a view of this planet, um, a fragile sphere of life floating in the uh, wide abyss of, of space. Um, and it developed uh, or you know, help develop uh, humanity's perspective on uh, life on on the planet as as a, as a as a finite entity. Uh, of course, our capacity to observe the Earth from space has increased, and and here's a picture of of Earth, a composite picture of Earth at night, showing just the widespread tremendous influence of humanity, uh, evident in the form of of night lights. Of course, that 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 consumption of energy um, has followed an exponential curve. And, and here are some, some data just uh, focused on the, uh, um, on the top two plots here. You know, the exponential growth in global population accompanied by an exponential growth in global energy consumption, uh, yielding you know, what, what is now about a 2,400 watt per person uh, rate of, of energy consumption. Notably, you know, humans as, a, as an organism require about 90 watts of energy to sustain themselves. And so this is, this is vastly in excess of our metabolic requirements, but of course affords um, the type of economic activity and quality of life that many of us have grown accustomed to. Um, as we all know, this activity has led to an accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere, and that's illustrated here by uh, over the, you know, by reference to the last thousand years, um, this plot shows a reconstruction of CO2 from bubbles trapped in ice um, on Antarctica. And again, you know, there's this exponential rise um, towards the end, driving um, changes in climate. Pictures like this have, are, uh, seem to be growing increasingly common. This is um, you know, flooding and, and uh, mudslides in British Columbia. Here's a, a drone footage of a, of a, of a, um, a cow that died um, in Brazil due to drought and fires in California. Um, last summer. So these types of extreme events are growing increasingly common. And indeed, um, just a few weeks ago, the IPCC released a report on impacts and adaptation. And here's a figure from that report showing that as climate change progresses uh, following, um, following a variety of scenarios, we can expect um, increases in the risk um, of, of various impacts. And, and that's represented over on the right here by this uh, burning embers diagram. And notably as global mean temperature increases according to the severity of these socioeconomic pathway scenarios, 
Um, so does the risk of severe disruption to, to unique and threatened ecosystems, extreme weather, um, you know, and, and other constituents that they considered here. Um, you know, we have deep concern for the quality of human life, but of course, this planet is host to uh, profoundly diverse and valuable ecosystems. And so, um, you know, the, the, the degree to which warming threatens these is a major concern. Here's a picture um, of a tree in a rainforest. And my own sort of domain is the ocean where we're already observing changes in ocean oxygen concentrations. Uh, that threaten marine life, um, uh, changes in pH, reductions in pH associated with ocean acidification that threaten marine life, and just the the, the capacity or the um, you know the reliance of, of humanity on ecosystem surfaces is provided by the ocean. These things are under threat as a result of of climate warming. Um, notably, we're going to have to rely on these natural systems as well as just protect them um, to achieve. Uh, climate stabilization, and this plot is a is is it just illustrates the degree to which um, the uh, the scenarios that that um, are consistent with um, two degree or one point five degree warming um, require uh, negative emissions, some of which must be accomplished negative not just emissions reductions but actual removal of CO two from the atmosphere via negative emissions, and some of that CO two. Uh, reduction must be accomplished by um, natural sinks, the ocean and terrestrial biosphere. So this presents a, a profound need. Um, this, this, this backdrop prevents profound need for, for um, quantitative information about the Earth system. Notably, um, action is, uh, our, our time to act is, is short. And, and this is another figure from the IPCC's recent report, just showing that you know, we're sort of at an inflection point now that can, um, that, you know, that as we delay, we become progressively more and more locked into paths that yield limited climate resilience. Um, this is, this sort of backdrop is critically important to consider, uh, but even without climate change, it's notable that the uh, climate system is highly dynamic. And so society will require information um, about that uh, dynamicism in order to make decisions. And here's, a, here's an illustration of just how this superposition of intr uh, intrinsic variability with force change um, occurs, uh, showing 50 year temperature, this, showing 50 year temperature trends um, from a large ensemble of the CCSM3 model. And, and just to illustrate that, you know, for instance, for Seattle, the, the um, the, the, the potential for very little warming to a lot of warming um, over, over the next 50 years is, uh, is sort of equally likely in the context of this ensemble. Um, you know, as you aggregate to, to progressively larger spatial scales, that internal variability is, is damped down and you recover this um, deterministic component of the force signal, which is the global mean temperature change. Um, notably, this type of variability is evident in multiple aspects of the Earth system. So here's a figure uh, showing 50-year uh, trends in dissolved oxygen in the thermocline of the North Pacific. And what I've done here is take the CESM large ensemble, version one large ensemble, and just uh, compute um, the component of, of the trend due to interannual variability. And so you can see that, you know, if we're living in a world like this ensemble member here, where the, the reductions, there are strong reductions in oxygen contributed by very natural variations in the climate system. Um, that world is very different from a world where, for instance, here the natural variability is actually driving um, increases in, in ocean oxygen concentrations. Okay, so where does NCAR fit into this picture of, um, uh, of addressing um, the impacts of, of climate variability and change on society. Well, in the, in the current strategic plan, um, we articulated a, a perspective that uh, is focused on actionable science motivated by um, critical societal needs. And that's illustrated in this figure here. So, you know, there's this set of societal, societal challenges and we have, um, we have, we desire to build climate resiliency and to, in, to develop um, uh, 
uh, decision support systems that enable people to make um, informed decisions. And at the core then of, of affecting these positive outcomes is a co-design process that pred is predicated on our ability to translate basic research into, um, into actionable or, or system outcomes. Well, a major um, source of our ability to generate information about the Earth system is in our supercomputing capacity. And here's a characterization of the state of that, uh, that space. So over the past several decades, we've relied on um, a, a development paradigm in the context of our modeling frameworks, which is to say, we increase the resolution of the models to get better process, you know, refined process representation, increase the complexity of the models to include new and more uh, diverse processes, and then also run both longer simulations and larger ensembles to generate more uh, statistical information about the Earth system. Each of these axes yields more data. And um, here's a pic picture uh, that I replotted from, from data uh, that Gary Strand gave me that just shows uh, the historical evolution of NCAR compute capacity um, in gray um, and in units of, and, and, then, and, and then the projected uh, or the storage, the amount of data that we're, we're storing in terabytes. And notably this strong uh, decline in the amount of storage per uh, compute cycle. Um, this picture, you know, this, this orange curve presents a worrisome uh, trend that is certainly uh, something that scientists around the institution are currently feeling the pinch of. But, you know, fundamentally, this uh, this increase in compute capacity uh, has provided us with the, the ability to generate a big data problem. And I'd just like to illustrate that here, taking data from the CESM large ensemble, a single uh, variable, single ocean um, field is about 60 gigabytes, you know, multiply that by about 35 ensemble members, and, and you get to um, a, a variable size of about two terabytes. And this is just one variable that you might want to include in an analysis um, of the dynamics of this integration. So um, needless to say, you know, two terabytes exceeds the memory capacity of um, most, um, you know, certainly most uh, personal computers, um, but present just presents a tremendous challenge to people um, trying to conduct uh, analysis workflows. Notably, this particular integration, you know, the, the, the paper documenting this currently has about 1700 citations, which indicates that this pain is being spread over um, a large number of people. So in this context, there's several challenges that arise. Um, one of which is that, you know, it, 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 it's been documented in several instances that uh, scientists spend huge fractions of their time um, on just getting data into the shape where it can be can be analyzed, um, we we suffer from insufficient sharing and reuse of our analysis codes. Um, ultimately, this leads to missed opportunities, both for uh, synthetic connections across disciplines and to discover um, phenomenology and um, and uh, and connections with stakeholders that um, might yield fruitful outcomes in the context of actionable science. Meanwhile, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence are growing in their capacity um, to generate innovative uh, approaches to, to data analysis and, and to science in general. Um, and we need to be better poised to leverage these technologies. Um, ultimately, this is a major barrier of entry um, that limits the diversity of our communities. And as a result, limits our ability to address problems um, from, from, from uh, benefiting from that diversity. So this leads me to sort of a, a fundamental question that many of us um, in the Earth System Data Science Initiative have, have kind of gravitated, gravitated towards, which is, you know, how can we address these challenges? How can we better democratize access to information um, in the Earth System? Well, here's sort of a, 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 a viewpoint on that. Um, this is intentionally an NCAR centric viewpoint because um, one of our major goals is to really build Earth System Data Science as a cross center theme that enables the institution as a whole to become more effective. So, you know, here are um, uh, the, the, the NCAR disciplines, um, you know, 
water resources, weather, air quality, climate, my solar and um, my solar uh, dynamics label got deleted somehow. But you know, within each of these disciplines, there's sort of this traditional uh, three paradigms of science, which is to say, you know, there's theory. We encode some of that theory in models. We and 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 verify those models against observations. We use um, large uh, computational infrastructure to simulate the systems of interest, and we basically generate scientific knowledge through the process of integrating these three paradigms um, in, in the context of analysis workflows. Um, ultimately, we'd like this process um, to yield community projects that entrain university collaborators and ultimately contribute to actionable science and convergent research. Um, we can sort of think about generalizing across these various disciplines. And one way to do that is to think about the phenomenology. So for instance, all of these disciplines display, you know, in the context of geophysical fluid dynamics, um, scale interaction, or they're chaotic and capable of generating perpetual novelty. You know, some subset of them have uh, fractal dynamics, so generates um, self-similarity self and, you know, lead to or are or, or governed in many cases by complexity theory and um, have behavior at the emergent scale that manifests from uh, local interactions aggregated across complex networks. Another approach to sort of generalizing across these disciplines is to focus on the operational context in which science is conducted, specifically data science. And I've uh, reformatted this diagram of of NCAR's disciplinary domains to put computational science or data science at the center. What is data science? Um, data science entails basically building abstractions of the data objects themselves so as to facilitate their, uh, their integration in an analysis workflow. So indeed, there's a lot that we share in common across the data sets that, um, and, and computational workflows that we uh, are engaged in invoking at NCAR. And so fundamentally, I believe that data science is a means through which we can build collaborations across the center and leverage those collaborations over time to generate synthetic outcomes in the context of actionable science. A major inspiration for the Earth System Data Science Initiative has been the Pangeo project. And this is, uh, was originally a EarthCube funded um, effort led by Ryan Abernathy at, um, at Columbia. Um, key NCAR collaborators are Kevin Paul and Sizzle and Joe Hammond, who's currently part-time in, in CGD. One of the key things that Pangeo was successful um, in doing is really identifying kind of key building blocks of a big data analysis ecosystem. So those include Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks that, that support interactive computing, um, X-Ray, which invokes a NetCDF-like data model in Python, Dask, which supports parallelism and parallel computing, which um, addresses some of the big data problems associated with um, having data sets that do not fit in memory and are computationally expensive to compute on. And then finally, um, data catalogs, which provide API-driven access to data, as well as cloud-optimized formats, ZAR, which is a, a, a file format that um, can, can, uh, can store data, basically NetCDF files in a cloud-friendly cloud -friendly way, which supports open science. So um, that leads us to sort of the definition of what we think your system data science initiative is and what our vision is. Um, the vision is to profoundly increase the effectiveness of our workforce by promoting deeper collaboration centered on analytics. And ultimately, um, through this process, we aim, to, we aim to serve the university community better and deliver actionable, reproducible science. So the approach we've taken here is really one of trying to cultivate a community of practice around the application of a common set of analysis tools and workflow elements. Um, and I'm gonna get into that now. So one question is, what are the values that promote an effective community culture to address data science challenges? We can think of this in the context of the Enlightenment and you know, the philosopher John Locke and others 
for instance, who laid down the principles that were ultimately enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution for this country, they laid out sort of operating principles that are fundamental to liberal democracy and capitalist society. Some of those things are uh, fraying at the margins now, but it's hard to argue that um, they, that you know they haven't had profound success at well as well. So what are these principles for Earth System data science? Well, one of which one of them is open science. And this is predicated on an idea that communication fuels progress. Uh, if you look at the history of science, one of the things that emerges is that science really took off when professional societies developed um, uh, uh, scientific journals that codified the framework for scientific communication. We're entering a new era now, and that language of science has begun to change. It's not just the narrative flow associated that, that might be associated with a particular manuscript, but rather um, there's a requirement that we publish um, the, the, the code and the algorithms that led, that underpin the, the scientific conclusions. And so this, this, um, this is a quote that I've taken from this um, consensus report by the National Academies, um, uh, suggesting that open science is, a, is a, 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 a paradigm that we need to embrace in our communities. So, so what, why justify this paradigm? Well, I've already said that, it, that communication is critical to um, scientific progress, but there's other reasons, other reasons we should embrace open science. The first is um, transparency. Um, there are changes afoot in the Earth system that require collective action to address, and stakeholders in the context of those um, actions have a right to know have a right to uh, understand the information upon which decisions are made. Ultimately, this feeds back into our political systems and an informed, you know, informed um, uh, uh, society requires, or uh, yeah, the democracy requires an informed society to function. Um, the quality of science is uh, improved um, because of the fundamental tenets of peer review. Um, as we expose more and more of our process to review, um, it's likely that we'll uh, uncover and eradicate errors, and this will advance the progression of knowledge. Um, efficiency, you know, if um, we're constantly reinventing the wheel, we're duplicating effort and that's inefficient. Um, but we also need to promote agility. We need to act fast to engage with the evolving climate crisis. And so um, open science is a way to promote that agility. And finally, equity. Um, this relates to this transparency notion, but specifically um, democratizing access to information across sectors of society, you know, um, is critical um, for society to function optimally. Here's an here's a, just one key result on this. Um, this is a uh, is data from a study that was published earlier this year in, in the journal Nature, and um, do, that documented basically um, socioeconomic. Uh, inequality in exposure to air pollution. And so what these maps show is um, the zip code level uh, PM 2.5, which is a significant um, pollutant causing um, respiratory uh, irritation, showing that basically um, you know, low income zip codes versus high income zip codes, the low income zip codes have proportionally higher, um, proportionally higher uh, impacts of, of air quality. This type of information locked away in esoteric scientific journals is probably not as impactful as it could be if it were um, readily accessible to um, broader segments of society. So another, so that was open science. Another tenant that is critical for um, ESDS to embrace is reproducibility. So um, this is a, a figure from a, a paper published um, more than a decade ago now in science, articulating um, this requirement. Replicability, the ability to repeat an experiment has been sort of a fundamental paradigm um, in science historically, but in, our comp in the computational domain, uh, strict replicability is not exactly uh, feasible in all respects. And so the second best thing um, is, is reproducibility. I think it's easy to underestimate 
the degree to which reproducibility, however, is potentially a revolutionary and transformative paradigm. So why focus on reproducibility? Well, improved, you know, uh, if, if you insist that your code is, is reproducible, um, that leads to um, validation and error checking that uh, requirements that, um, you know, eliminate errors. Um, reproducible frameworks um, also facilitate um, better access to collaboration and then review, which feeds back onto the quality of the product. Um, reproducibility enables us to ensure continuity across products, um, projects, and, and groups. And so, you know, I face this um, regularly bringing, for instance, a new staff member on board um, to the extent that our workflows are poorly documented and not reproducible, that person, a new person sort of starts from scratch, um, but handing off something that's that's well documented and, and reproducible enables progress to, you know, enables people to hit the ground running much faster. Um, encapsulated workflows provide opportunities um, to, to expand the exploration of parameter space. I've seen this in my own my own work where I'm in, I'm working on a calculation and I want to understand the sensitivity to the assumptions. Um, if I write that calculation as a reproducible workflow, I can ex I can very rapidly um, expand or explore parameter space. Um, and then finally, relax demands on developers to support backwards compatibility. I think this is a subtle point in the sense that, you know, for instance, the NCL project had a very strong ethic of supporting backwards compatibility, the risk of um, insisting on backwards compatibility is an expansion of technical debt. Um, so a focus on reproducibility is a subtly different focus. There's challenges to enable um, robust reproducibility for sure, but it provides uh, the freedom to, to break things in, the, in, the, in, the, in a future looking uh, focus on innovation. So my thesis is that over time, um, a focus on reproducibility is kind of a fulcrum about which we can bend our science. And as we uh, collectively grow our capacity to generate reproducible workflows, we'll lower the technical barriers to, to, uh, to interdisciplinary collaboration and be capable of more fluidly engaging with stakeholder communities across broader segments of society. So how do we do reproducible science? Well, here's sort of an image that I find um, uh, um, that, that kind of summarizes you know, some aspects of this. It tends to be a circuitous path through um, a landscape that is fraught with hazards. Um, but I think we're growing perspective and, and, and tools that um, uh, are actually enabling this to become a reality. So here's sort of our, our schematic of the Earth System Data Science Initiative. We have, you know, the notion that um, these sort of four components need to work together um, in the context of actionable science objectives um, to, to generate progress. And so in this domain, um, you know, we there's a there's a sort of a focus on the analysis software, there's data workflows um, and platforms, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and then finally, engagement um, with decision support frameworks and engagement with, um, with stakeholders. So I'm just gonna go through um, some thoughts on each of these. So first, um, just uh, on, on the data side, um, you know, one imperative is to provide API-driven access to, to data assets. So for reproducible workflows that are shareable, this is a critical um, component. Here's an example of a way to address this. Um, using some tools that, uh, that we've um, helped develop here at NCAR. Um, this is leveraging Intake, which is a Python package that uh, is a data cataloging, provides data cataloging capabilities. And we've extended Intake to, um, to, uh, to in a package called Intake ESM, which is designed to um, handle complex data sets, uh, such as those generated by Earth system models. The idea here is that you can um, establish, uh, you can basically connect to a catalog object that um, is searchable through a semantic, a semantic API. So you can, you know, here's an instance where um, we're searching for CMIP data. And then um, that there is this API basically can, can return um, directly a, 
a X-ray data set that can be used for analysis in the context of a, of a workflow. Um, I've been uh, working recently with data from um, uh, the ERA-5 reanalysis uh, produced by the ECMWF and was pleased to see that um, they have a GUI on their, on their website that enables you to generate code like this, which is a reproducible API to retrieve um, reanalysis data. Um, typically, uh, uh, data access or you know data access on the web can be a substantial challenge, but is critical to um, a reproducible workflow. Um, and and here's a project um, led by Ryan Abernathy called Pangeo Forge that aims to solve this problem um, specifically to support cloud-based workflows. And so the idea here is that there is some data archive, you know, such as the SMWF. Um, there is a, a recipe that basically um, downloads data and then some computation that is done to reformat that data, address metadata deficiencies or, or um, you know, chunking attributes, and ultimately stores that data in a format that's analysis ready. Critically, this, this, um, this, this framework is, is versionable and can be updated and refined um, as the underlying data sets change evolve. This is not uh, an easy problem in all instances. And for instance, here's um, the web form that enables you to download uh, CO2 data in the OBS pack format distributed by, by NOAA. And, and in this case, there's an authentication, uh, basically an authentication layer where you, you know, registration is required. And so it's, it's, it's impossible, you know, so there's, there's probably good reasons to, um, to, to put this uh, layer in place, but it precludes actually automating um, the data access portal. Okay, so the second thing here in the context of reproducible workflows is to encapsulate code in computational environments. Um, so why does this matter? Well, here's just a very simple illustration. So depending on uh, the computational environment, the answers of an analysis can change. And for example, uh, the definition of, or the default behavior for integer division changed between Python 2 and Python 3. So Python 2 treated integer division as integer division and Python 3 treats integer treats the division of integers as a gener general division problem. So you get different answers and so it's obviously critical then to control your computational environment. Another reason that makes this really important is that we are no longer in a world where you can download an integrated uh, piece of software like NCL or IDL or MATLAB to compute, uh, to, to accomplish the analysis objectives. Rather, um, analysis is uh, performed on the basis of a diverse and um, a, a diverse uh, and independently developed collection of tools that need to be brought together in an integrated way that supports uh, compatibility between the versions of those tools and enables um, basically an aggregate set of functionality to be achieved through this disparate, through these independent projects. And so really that's, um, that's a critical, you know, that um, um, encapsulating computational environments um, is critical to address that challenge. Um, there are a variety of approaches and I am by no means expert in this area, um, but for instance, um, you know, uh, Binder is a way to um, build environments um, on cloud-based systems. Um, Binder, I think, in many cases, um, can is uh, can leverage different technology. And two sort of things, um, two sort of common utilities here are, are Conda, which is a Py which is a Python-based package manager, and Docker, which is a which is a container framework that enables you to um, wrap up both. Uh, both sort of a, a specific Python environment, but also um, basically the entire operating system as, as is the case in virtual machines. Um, in my personal workflows here, sort of, I find this to be um, mostly a, a nuisance and, um, and somewhat challenging to, uh, to uh, a somewhat challenging barrier to collaboration. Typically in my projects, what I do is I generate an environment uh, .yaml file that uh, specifies the packages that um, I require to accomplish an analysis. I use that file to create an environment. Um, oftentimes I want to add a package or update the version of the packages that are used so I can update 
um, my environment on the basis of that YAML file. And then finally, I've been exploring the use of this Conda lock utility, which actually writes a file that has the specific uh, machine dependent uh, point, pointers to the actual package uh, files that were that were used on the Conda Forge channel, and so um, an exact replicate of all the versioning um, it, it, uh, invoked in an, in, a, in an environment can be um, can be achieved by uh, leveraging this Conda lock framework. Okay, another requirement for this uh, workflows and platforms. Um, segment of, of the Earth System Data Science uh, landscape is to support interactivity. And um, I think, you know, Sizzle and, and people like Kevin Paul and Anderson Banahirwe have been um, instrumental in, in enabling um, Jupyter Hub service to be uh, provided to the community um, on the Sizzle compute systems. And basically this provides a, a, um, an interactive framework for, for computation in the form of Jupyter Notebooks. I think it's worth pointing out that um, Jupyter uh, Lab provides a very diverse framework for, um, for, for conducting analysis. So here's a, just a, a screenshot of um, what my, my Jupyter Lab interface might look like on any given even day, you know, there's, a, there's a file browser where you have um, GUI access to the file system. Um, a, a section for Jupyter Notebooks. Over time, Jupyter has incorporated uh, data as a first-class citizen in the Jupyter Lab landscape. And so here, for instance, is a CSV file that, that you, you know, and there's other sort of frameworks. And then finally, you know, a command prompt where you can interact with the operating system. Oh, not just finally, a command prompt where you can interact with the operating system and also a, um, a, a replete editor that enables um, editing of, of code. Okay, another requirement of, of platforms is to support scalability. So the notion of scalable analysis codes is that you can write code um, on small problems. But one, one, one definition is that code written and applied to small problems can be easily um, applied to at scale to larger problems, leveraging parallelism. And, um, and so this has implications um, both for how we write code but also um, for the underlying um, compute architecture. Um, as I've mentioned earlier in the presentation, Dask is a key uh, package enabling functionality in this space. Dask basically provides um, a, a parallel, uh, parallelized data model. And here's an illustration of a Dask array composed of composite NumPy arrays. And then Dask also enables constructing these task graphs that, um, that uh, basically apply operations to each of these uh, array chunks in parallel. I think it's worth noting that this, uh, there's aspects of these scalable computational workflows for, you know, applied in the context of analysis that conflict with sort of the historical paradigms common in the HPC world. And in particular, um, I might require the use of 200 um, processors or, or, you know, for, for a period of five minutes. And so that, you know, whereas, Whereas um, the, the traditional approach of running a large geophysical model retains the compute resource for a period of several hours, um, analysis workflows can yield highly elastic demand. Okay, so that was um, sort of a, a view, uh, you know, uh, incomplete, highly incomplete, but um, I touched on some points relevant to um, data workflows and platforms. I'd like to talk a little bit about analysis software at this point and just sort of present a generalization, which is the, to say that um, abstractions of workflow components is the key. So, what do that? What does that enable? Well, we want We want to be able to write analysis codes like we write prose, and this is um, uh, encapsulated by the computer science uh, term expressiveness, which is to say that there is an operator for what you want to do, and this is illustrated here. This was written by my colleague Deepak Charyan, um, where you have some data set and you might want to um, uh, take the mean of the eastward component of the velocity as a function of, of ENSO phase. And so code like this is, um, is a pleasure, both a pleasure to write and lowers the barrier um, uh, to, to generate, you know, basically it accelerates the time in which you can develop functional, functional code. 
Um, we need frameworks that are modular. And I think the, you know, the Python stack really is exemplary in this regard where you know, low level utilities like NumPy um, are basically leveraged by uh, tools like, like X-Ray. And each of these packages has sort of a finite scope that enables it to develop appropriate development um, and testing infrastructure to retain that scope, but exposes APIs to enable leveraging. And I think a related notion to modularity is extensibility. We should approach um, writing analysis codes with an explicit aim of extensibility. So a lot of these principles are, are really uh, evident in these building blocks um, that of, of, the big, of a big data analysis ecosystem that have been identified by Pangeo. Um, kind of specific to that, um, to that particular analysis stack are some principles like, our, you know, we should write codes that consume and produce X-ray data sets. So if we're doing, if we're engaged in um, geoscience analysis workflows, you know, and we write functions that look like this, um, this becomes a highly portable um, entity in that the compute X step accepts a data set and some arguments and returns a data set. So we have a clear understanding of what the API um, for these analysis workflows is. Another principle is to be Dask friendly. There's way to, ways to break um, Dask parallelism in the context of your analysis code. And so avoiding those so as to enable leveraging par uh, parallelism through the stack is critical. Um, another aspect of Pangeo has been um, the, uh, or that I've been impressed with, is the degree to which um, a huge community of people have come together and, uh, and, and basically achieved um, advances in key aspects of analysis functionality as a collective. And I think that's really important for our institution to um, avoid, you know, to, to basically engage in that community. And where there are solutions, um, we should leverage those solutions. Um, and so this is kind of enshrined in the principle um, of avoiding the not invented here syndrome. But another sort of way to kind of remind ourselves is that we should write code as a last resort. We should really focus on where there are indeed critical gaps um, in the infrastructure and focusing on addressing those gaps. Okay, so that was a short uh, an incomplete tour of the analysis software um, uh, landscape. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, sort of progression towards this decision support and engagement piece and acknowledging that I, you know, there are other people at the institution who are doing this um, at a much higher level than I am. Uh, my perspective comes um, from uh, sitting mostly in the realm of esoteric science and trying to engage more uh, directly um, uh, you know, with issues of societal relevance, I guess I see a path through reproducible science to um, enabling a more collective approach to that. So as an example, I'd just like to highlight this paper that um, I, I published with uh, several colleagues last year. And this, this is a paper that synthesizes um, modeling and observational data to make an estimate of the air sea flux of CO2 uh, out of the Southern Ocean, which is a critical uncertainty in the global carbon cycle. Well, you know, publishing a paper um, in, a, in a scientific journal is definitely a traditional um, approach, uh, traditional scientific paradigm. Um, but I'm very proud uh, that, you know, we were also um, able to publish this Jupiter book that um, uh, provides um, a reproducible workflow to, um, to generate, to, you know, to, to basically reproduce the analysis that we published in this paper. So Britt Stevens um, from EOL and I collaborated quite extensively on this analysis. I will say that I'm not proud of all the code that is in this, um, you know, that underlies this Jupyter book, um, but, you know, we've made our best effort um, over a period of several years, actually working on this analysis to wrap it up into a, and, and to document it in such a way that somebody else coming along or you know, that we could leverage um, our effort for, for future projects. So Jupyter books uh, really, I think, comprise a, an excellent paradigm um, in the context of transitioning towards reproducible workflows because they naturally kind of match um, the, the manuscript-driven um, uh, paradigms that, that, science, um, you know, that, are, that science is historically based on. 
And so, um, you know, support for these sort of computational narratives and a focus on generating computational narratives around the institution could be a, an important sort of first step, first entry point for people um, trying to engage in, in this. Here's uh, a screenshot from a, another um, calculation that I've been working on. Um, and in this case, I've started the calculation uh, with the intention of publishing it as a Jupyter book, which is um, a sort of 2.0 uh, approach for me that um, I think uh, my, I've recognized sort of an improvement in my capacity to, to work on, on reproducible science. One of the things though that I'm highlighting here that's super exciting is the ability to configure these Jupyter books with a direct link to the Jupyter, the Sizzle Jupyter Hub compute environment. And this is not uh, completely working or it's definitely not working smoothly in all cases right now. But this is an interesting capability because you know, in the context of collaboration on, on GitHub um, and with a, a broad array of collaborators, you know, essentially I can provide a link to the analysis workflow that can be opened directly um, on the Sizzle Compute architect, our, uh, infrastructure and enable collaborators and other people to, to engage. Now it does require authentication. Um, and so those people need to have an account. But I think in terms of um, being able to share and collaborate on these kinds of workflows and actually execute the code in these computational narratives, there's some exciting developments. Finally, I'd just like to highlight another area where I've been working and um, uh, which, is, which is directly on this, um, this requirement for a society to meet um, uh, net zero carbon emissions through uh, basically uh, um, Neg uh, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And currently a major area of focus for this is ocean, um, ocean carbon dioxide removal. And here's an illustration of the various um, techniques uh, that people are thinking about. I'll just highlight one here, which is to say, which is um, macroalgae cultivation. The idea is that you can grow uh, macroalgae species in the surface ocean and subsequently um, uh, sink that biomass material constituting a net transfer of carbon from the atmosphere um, to the deep ocean. Well, we've been working on a study recently where we're um, attempting to uh, characterize the global potential for macroalgae cultivation. And here is a figure um, from a, a paper that is recently submitted documenting um, basically the, the, the harvest potential under two different um, scenarios, considering the role of nutrients and constraining production. Um, through collaboration with um, a, a group uh, called Carbon Plan that um, actually Joe Hammond is uh, a key uh, leader of, we've, um, Carbon Plan has basically taken the data we generated in this uh, analysis and developed a decision support framework that is really predicated on the idea that if indeed society is going to engage in negative emission, you know, in, in fostering negative emissions through macroalgae cultivation, there's implications for how that industry will, will grow. And in particular information about where macroalgae cultivation is possible and what are the key cost constraints on making investments in a macroalgae cultivation uh, uh, framework you know, that information is critical in, in making decisions. And so this, um, this is a web-based tool that uh, basically exposes our data and all the assumptions therein, enabling uh, these, you know, putative investors or, or um, entrepreneurs to, um, to investigate the implications of our study in a much more dynamic way than would be possible reading a paper. So I think this is a, this is sort of a basic proof of concept of this kind of thing, but I think is, a, is, a, uh, is, is exemplary in the sense that it's pointing in the direction to exposing information through an analysis pipeline to stakeholders. Okay, so I'd just like to wrap up and um, I'm just gonna to return to this slide that, you know, one of the, our, our thesis basically is that, um, is that, you know, NCAR has uh, observations, um, modeling infrastructure, computing infrastructure um, that uh, provide a, a exceptionally deep foundation for engaging in actionable research problems. But we really need to invest um, in the community 
uh, and in, in our capacity to accelerate the analysis component of science, of science um, specifically in the context of actionable research objectives. So there's several components of an extant framework here, one of which is the, Geo, um, the GeoCAT team in CISL developing, you know, ostensibly hardened down uh, software capacity uh, supporting analysis. Another component is uh, CISL's experimental development team, um, which is really focused on prototyping solutions to big data problems. Um, a third uh, component of this is, is education and um, I'm a participant uh, in this Geo, uh, EarthCube um, funded project led by John, John Klein, which is really focused on um, Python education, specifically in the context of earth sciences. Um, a product of the Pythia, um, Pythia project is this Pythia Foundations book, which is becoming a go-to resource um, for uh, Python in instruction. Um, finally, a, a component of how um, we envision Earth system uh, data science community to function is really that there are roles around the institution um, for people to engage um, in this. And specifically, there's sort of expectations for, for scientists, researchers to, to basically you know, start using um, cutting edge tools in the context of specifically divine, uh, defined software or you know, science questions to engage with um, software developers on the application of their tools to those problems um, in collaboration with people maintaining and um, developing uh, the computing platforms and, and data resources. And so really what is required is sort of an agile development framework where these groups of people are interacting to achieve um, specific outcomes. And, and, and you know, this kind of engagement and communication um, really predicated on, on strong collaboration across these entities. Um, will uh, yield positive outcomes for the institution at large. Um, one of the activities that we've been engaged in is um, it, through ESDS is, uh, is, is, a, is a blog. And here's just two examples from, from this blog where um, we're trying to you know, address the fact that knowledge is inhomogeneously distributed across the center and that um, by publicizing you know, capacities um, with the stack, we can help get people up and running and engaged. Um, communication is critical. And so we've been holding um, Earth System Data Science Fora every two weeks where there is an opportunity to discuss work in progress um, and provide sort of short instruction on, on particular things. This is a key component of our community building effort. And then uh, another, another framework is the ZULIP, um, uh, organization that Kevin Paul uh, started. And this has been a really, really productive place for people to ask questions um, in kind of a, a, um, a friendly, uh, sort of lowers the bar to asking, asking questions in, in a friendly community. So, um, you know, the objectives here are to start small and grow this effort to encompass a larger, a larger pool of people. And so um, I'd encourage those of you listening online to reach out, get engaged, um, get plugged in on Zulip, um, and you know think about how your effort can 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 tap in and um, benefit the collective. And with that, I'll just I'm happy to take any questions and engage in discussion. All right. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for an insightful and uh, inspirational uh, talk. Uh, before we turn to questions, just a quick reminder to our television audience at home to please go ahead and type your questions into Slido at the bottom of the screen. And I believe the questions are visible to you, Matt. Yep. Um, let's see. So uh, Brian asks, um, code expressiveness usually comes at the expense of generality that seems unavoidable. So while frameworks can help streamline certain types of workflow, it seems impossible to derive a general framework for each steady state and also serve everyone. Um, I, yeah, I mean, in principle, I agree with that. However, um, I think you know we should uh, we should define our aspirations and then bite off um, chunks or take steps towards aspirational visions that are manageable. Uh, I think X-ray does this very nicely, where 
Um, it defines a data model in terms of dimensions and coordinates, and then defines operators that work across those dimensions and coordinates. So in fact, you know, that has the potential to be both uh, expressive and fairly general. Um, Apparently, I'm supposed to ask the questions for you, uh, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're challenging my 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 limited literacy. Right? My bad. Uh, fantastic, fantastic talk, Matt. Uh, sorry, I was not able to host today. This is from Jeff DLB, uh, but I thank John for stepping in. How can NCAR encourage reward staff, especially software engineers, to write reusable code and others' code and use others' code instead of writing? new custom code? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I don't uh, presume to know the answer, uh, but I think part of the answer re revolves around um, cultural norms that, um, you know, that, that we just have to embrace uh, sort of this agile model, which is focused on actually, you know, achieving functionality in, uh, you know, in, in sort of the least amount of time. Um, I also think that um, part of this is part of the cultural development is to really sort of identify where um, there are people, you know, who know things around the institution and, and stitch together our uh, collaborative networks in ways that, um, you know, that are somewhat novel. I think, you know, this is particularly true um, with, you know, with, with Sizzle, where there is a lot of expertise, um, some of that expertise, you know, in, in the computing. Some of that expertise um, is less readily accessible, um, you know, across the institution, um, just because we're siloed and, and we have um, we have sort of uh, historical barriers to collaboration. So, you know, Earth System Data Science Initiative is provides a venue to sort of help break those down and get people engaged, you know, in just getting things done. Okay, thank you. So, uh, next question. Uh, from Tasia, what is on the top of your wish list for things that you'd like to see from Sizzle that would support the ESD, ESDS vision? And what about changes that might need to happen on the science side to support this vision? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, I feel like uh, we, you know, a number of us have been sort of um, working towards an ESDS vision for a, for a long time. And there's a few things that are sort of critical rate limiting steps. One is to have sort of a baseline degree of functionality that enables, um, you know, enables people to, to, to jump in and start getting work done right away. And so I think that really requires kind of a core engineering team that can, um, you know, make sure that basic things don't, that, that, that there's sort of the basic capacities work and that, you know, are, are continually working to advance those capacities. It's very easy to alienate people um, when they attempt to do something and, uh, and it doesn't work, right? And so they sort of go away and say, oh, I'm just going to go back to my own, you know, how I was doing things before. I think from the perspective of the, of the science side, you know, there really requires this, we sort of need, need this, the, the scientific community to really um, embrace these new paradigms of open science and reproducible science as a requirement. And I think, you know, that needs to be, needs to occur through a combination of sort of top-down, you know, articulation of the value of abiding by these tenants, as well as, uh, you know, recognition that over time, investing in these things actually improves our, uh, both our efficiency and capacity to conduct cutting edge science. So really the, you know, there's this collective kind of vision we need we need people to to express. We need our leadership to express, you know, that vision um, and, and commitment to that vision, um, and we need staff to sort of recognize how they fit in and contribute to um, improving the community in that regard. All right. Looks like we have time for just uh, one more question, Matt, from uh, Doug Schuster. Uh, how do you incentivize researchers to share code? when many are reluctant to do so. Uh, for example, my code is poorly documented. I don't want to maintain it forever. It contains unpublished research components and, and so on. Uh, researchers have traditionally been rewarded for hoarding code uh, to uh, publish and secure funding. 
Yeah, uh, so I recognize those um, those challenges. Um, I uh, and I don't expect that we will, you know, be able to reach everybody uh, with buy-in on these on these new paradigms. But I just I go back to the beginning of my talk. We live in an era uh, defined by um, humanity as a planetary scale threat uh, to the viability of the Earth system, and and we can't afford to um, to to dither around, you know, with respect to generating useful uh, research products. Defined by, um, you, sorry, I'm getting an echo. Um, so, you know, I think particularly uh, as our role as scientists at the National Center, we need to be on the forefront of this open science and reproducible science um, movement. And I think that um, we should expect that our scientific staff and our software engineering staff buy into those paradigms and deliver uh, exemplary scientific workflows on behalf of you know, our own scientific initiatives and as, um, as a means of helping lead the community in this important direction. All right, well, thank you very much again, Matt, for your talk today. Uh, lots of uh, virtual applause from our remote audience. Thank you again. Thanks, John. Thanks everyone for tuning in.